What up, UFC, Bellator, PFL, MMA fans? This is another episode of the Calf Kick Experience, number two, ever since we underwent a name change from the Calf Kicks MMA show. Um, we, we decided to go with a name change and switch over to the Calf Kick Experience, not because of the Joe Rogan experience, but because we like the, uh, we like the acronym CKE that uh, went a little bit more with CTE, which is what we're seeing a lot of guys do when they get hit in the face because we're watching Absolutely. a violent sport. We are coming at you live on a Tuesday night, May 4th, 2021, because we got a Bellator card this weekend, and we got a UFC fight night this weekend, and we have a lot of other big stuff coming up. Uh, Gage has a couple of finals, finishing his last full semester at Texas State. My girlfriend, Helene Chacon, is graduating at LSU. Uh, Gage's little brother, Ethan, is signing a preferred walk-on to go play football at Texas State. So congratulations to everybody in the class of 2021 from the Calf Kicks experience. And before we get started, before we talk about last weekend, we wanted to kind of start off with a little comedic relief and relate back to a, something we talked about last week. And we found a video from Gage and I's experience where we are, our experiment, excuse me, where we were trying to determine the effectiveness of calf kicks in MMA. So we're going to go ahead and show you what the consequences of that may or may not look like. <laughs> yeah, that's my leg. That was after throwing a kick and hitting shin on shin contact on my friend here. Because that's, that's the kind of friends we are. Those are the kind of people we are. We like to hurt each other for fun. Yeah, if you don't kick your best friend in the shin, the hell are you doing? Yeah, what kind of friends are you really? <laughs> so let's get into it. Let's let's talk about last weekend, UFC Fight Night. Reyes, and I want to apologize for my mispronunciation last week, but Reyes versus Prohashka. Absolutely. What do you think, What'd you Did, think man? Um, That spinning elbow was disgusting. And uh, just not to brag, but brought to you by... Shithead and Shithead Sportsbook. I went two, one, and one. Zach? I went one, two, and one. I had Giga Chikadza. I, th I thought that one through, but I, I didn't I didn't think Prahashka was as good as he looked. I, mis I made a mistake, and I mistook the way that he strikes, and I mistook his um, recklessness for wildness in terms of having a lack of technique to put offensive pressure on the opponent. But Prohashka came the entire time relentlessly. His output was incredible. His efficiency was awesome. And what was that? Before that, there was only like three spinning back elbows that were for knockouts in the entire UFC history, and now he's four. So we're seeing a guy who's performing extremely difficult techniques at an extremely high level. So I, at 205, he's definitely going to be a dangerous contender coming up in the near future. I agree with you, but his style is super dangerous. I mean, not only from an offensive perspective, but his defense did not look good. He got wobbled. He was lucky not to get finished by Dom. I mean, <clears throat> hats off to them. That was five night without a doubt. No, that first round, we might still be sitting around talking in January as one of the rounds of the year because they were, they were going at it. That was offensive MMA from both perspectives, about as good as it could have looked for, you know, as long as it could have looked with that high of technical strikers. Yeah, I mean, it looked – Prohoshka looked a lot like Wonderboy in that karate style, and it looked good. Like I said, his defense was troubling to me. Like. When he gets up there to the big boys like Glover Teixeira and uh, Polish Power, he's going to have a real issue, I think. And, I mean, he's a contender for sure. Now is he a top contender? That's the bait. Um, yeah, no, I definitely think – I saw a lot of people in the media talking about maybe putting him in there with the winner of Teixeira Blahovich and giving him the next title shot at 205. But I think you got to test him one more time. I think Dom Reyes was a definitely, you know, top of the division guy, definitely that name win that's going to put him in that contention. But you know what I didn't know and what we didn't touch on last weekend? I didn't know that he had beaten Nemkov. 
previous. Oh, the Bellator champion? Uh-huh. Where did he beat him in Ryzen? Uh, maybe. I don't remember what promotion it was under, but I didn't realize how many professional fights Prohoshka actually had and how experienced, even though he's new to the UFC, how experienced he actually was. Yeah. Because obviously, he, he didn't let that stage get to him. No, not not by any stretch of the means. Um, he, from what I what I've read and what I've heard, is he was waiting to get into the UFC until he was ready to hit the biggest stage, and I think it served him well. He did not look like he was phased by the main event, you know. No, being not by any means. Five round fight. And I think at this point, you know, given the hair, given the personality in the press conferences, even though he's not a very good English speaker, you know, given the performance and given his, the, I, what I like that he said in his post-fight press conference is that he wanted to showcase the art. He didn't want to go out there and just win fights. He wanted to look good technically and put on a display of mixed martial arts. So I respect the guy, and I think he's going to get a lot of attention because he has that character. No, and I think as MMA fans in general, I think we love to see that. Like, guys that truly treat it as a martial art and express their ways in their, in their body, you know? And that's that's kind of <laughs> excuse me, that's kind of what was really sad, I think, for a lot of us when you saw Anderson Silva kind of get knocked out and lose his UFC contract because he was one of those guys and he's uh, you know he's got Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. he's in a boxing match now but he's one of those guys that I think expresses himself like that and I'd like to see him be able to do that for as long as he's physically capable like yeah. I would for a lot of these guys yeah there are some guys <laughs> that just that the striking is just out of this world it's just beautiful to watch and I think for a hot <laughs> put that on display on Saturday yeah I think what's next for those two guys I definitely don't think Prohoshka is any less than a main event fighter now I think you I think you got to make him versus Rakic for the number one contender in the light heavyweight at the 205 division and then you know for Dom Reyes I think at this point it only makes sense to put him in there with Tiago Silva both guys that are under the John Jones curse who fought Santos, John Tiago Jones. Santos. Yes, Tiago Santos, not Tiago Silva, sorry. Tiago Santos. But, uh, yeah, you know, guys that have been on a slide, both guys that are still, you know, pretty young, both guys that can still do damage at 205 and are still definitely contenders, but definitely both guys that need to go back to the drawing board and reassess where they're at in their careers. Yeah, absolutely, and I agree with that. All right, which one do you want to talk about first? UFC or Bellator? Um, I want to hit one more thing on last weekend with you first. Okay, go ahead. We move on. What about that Kudalaba Dustin Jacoby fight, the split draw? I did not think that was a split draw. I got lucky because I had Jacoby, but I don't know how more than one judge didn't give Kudalaba a 10 8 in that first round. I mean, yeah, I mean, only one, you're right, one judge gave him 10-8, and then, you know, personally, I thought it was, the first round was a 10-8 for Kudalaba, and certainly the uh, the broadcast crew thought so as well. I mean, all right, all maybe the second and third though. rounds were, were won by Jacoby, but it wasn't by, like, a huge margin. It could have gone, one judge could have shot saw the last two rounds a, certain, a different way, and we could be looking at a Kudalaba win. No, I think Jacoby definitely... Mm -hmm barely did enough to squeeze 10 nines out of the second and third round kind of because like I touched on last weekend you saw Kudalaba get tired and you saw the striking output go way down from that first round but the first round he had him pinned up against the cage and he was beating his ass the whole time that was the definition of a 10-8 yeah he it, damn near I, finished him I just mean he damn near finished him he inflicted all of that damage and at no point in that first round did I think Jacoby was winning the fight like he, he lost that first round definitively. And I, you know, there's just another case of nobody knows how these fights are scored. Nobody knows what the, what the rules are and how these judges go about it. So, you know, another loss for the Las Vegas, for the Nevada State Athletic Commission. You know, one thing that I do like that uh, one FC incorporates in their global rule set is they judge the fight on its entirety, not round by round which, I mean, it's more subjective, 
obviously. But I think all, you can overturn like a 10 eight round to where somebody else might have, after the first round, just dominated. And then you judge the fight on a whole, not just round by round, because that skews things. No, I think it makes a lot of sense. I think you, I don't know if you can get rid of round for round completely, because then you discredit, like, you know, the guy that wins the first three rounds but loses the championship rounds and everybody, you know, remembers the last two and you give that you give him the win and it's like, you know, maybe based on points he might not have won. But, you know, I like the idea of reassessing how we go about scoring the UFC because I think, especially over the past year, we've seen a lot of crazy decisions and a lot of things that, like, just had people turning their heads upside down. Yeah, obviously. I mean, when you have subjectivity, in the sport and the judging in particular, it gets really dicey really quick and it's sometimes evident. But they're right more times than they're wrong, in my opinion. I'll give you but that. People always remember the wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So I oh. think I, I think we hit on that one pretty good. You know, I, I like G, I like Giga Chikadze coming up in the division at what I think it's one forty five is what yeah. we're talking about because he's I mean, he's a big dude. It looks he's like. huge for that division. And that liver kick was no, no, like no playing around. That was tough. Like, I mean, that, that was a, that was technical kickboxing at its best. I mean, he looked like the dominant striker. For sure. So, looking at it, I think we're gonna start with the Bellator fights this weekend, just because Bellator 258 over the another UFC fight night. This one A has a belt fight. B it seems to have more implications in every single fight. There's a light, light heavyweight Grand Prix fight. And C3, it has all of the bigger names, starting with our boy Michael Venom Page, MVP, versus Derek Anderson. And the odds I have right now from DraftKings have Michael Venom Page as a minus 305 favorite in this fight and Derek Anderson starting at plus 225. So what do you think about that? All right, starting with MVP at minus 305. I'm taking that all day long, bro. So the cows come home, bro. Dude, MVP, like I was saying with Prohoshka, dude, just absolute beautiful striking. His defense, kind of like Prohoshka's, but he's quicker because they're, I believe this is catch weight at 175, which is above yeah. welterweight. But, uh, dude, he moves so effortlessly. Switches side, southpaw, or, orthodox hits you from all kinds of different angles. I mean, I don't really know about the other guy too much, but what I can say is Michael Venom Page on the ground or on the stand up all day long. So I'll take the other side of that actually because I agree with you. I think Michael Venom Page is one of the craftier strikers in all of the MMA promotions. Like you said, I think he creates angles kind of like Wonder Boy that we talked about them cross promotionally fighting. That'd be really cool, like we said. But they create angles that other people don't, and they create, they put themselves in position to strike and to hit you in the face from places that you don't see typically and are hard to prepare for. But talking about Derek Anderson, he's only 31. Not that that's young, but he's not out of the prime of his career, and he's on a three fight win streak. So you see him getting better. And, you know, looking at his record, he's beaten Patricky Pitbull twice, Absolutely. actually. He, but that was at lightweight, too. He's coming up. So, I mean, it's yeah. interesting to see how he'll fight. I don't know how many fights he's had at 170, but it'll be interesting to, sit, to see his success at a bigger weight class. See, I don't know necessarily what his, um, what his you know, style is per se I don't know if he's a grappling guy but if you look at his record too he also went all the way to a split decision in Bellator with Brent Primus who's one of the best grapplers in the world you know one of those submission underground guys that'll go just do jujitsu and Derek Anderson has six submissions so as much as I'm sitting here hyping him up at 17 and three I think this is a, this would be a better matchup than we give it credit for but like we've been saying Michael Venom Page is just too damn good, man. He strikes too well, and I think we're going to see him put this guy away. Um, I, you know, I think if you have a value bet, I wouldn't place Derek Anderson personally, 
But if there's a value bet that we're looking here, Derek Anderson at plus 225 would be your big win for the weekend. Yeah. And I'm putting my money on Venom Page. Yeah. Um, what is his ranking? Is it number three in the welterweight division? Anderson? Yeah. I'm not exactly sure. I'm not 100% sure. Because I know Venom Page is the number one contender with obviously Douglas Lima being the champion. I mean, yeah. Douglas Lima is, I don't know, dude, he's out of this world. He's nasty. But I also don't know if they've fought Venom Page versus Douglas Lima. I'd like to see that one if it's happened, but maybe a second time. I don't know. Um, let's see. I just pulled up welterweight. Oh, this is old. Man, we're never we're never gonna find this ranking in time. So let's just let's just move on. I think I'm with you. I think I'm taking Michael Venom Page at minus three oh five here. Then on top of that, we have the exact same line for Patricky Pitbull versus Peter Queeley. Patricky minus 305 and Queeley, the Irishman, at plus 225. Now, Pitbull's an interesting story. I mean, obviously, you got the Pitbull brothers, his brother, his younger brother, I believe, uh, Patricio. Dude, Patricio, pound for pound, might be one of the best in the entire world. And not many people know about him because he's not fighting the UFC. I mean, um, he, he said he came out and he said that point blank, I can beat. Um, the UFC what uh champion at featherweight, which is Volkanovski. 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 Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, his little brother, badass. Patricky, he's a little bit older. I mean, I think he can still get it done, but I don't think it's as a lock as MVP. I don't know if it's as a lock either, but I think the thing to be said for Patricky is he's fought everybody, you know. He fought Michael Chandler back in, I think it was 2011. So not recently, but, you know, he fought one of the best to ever do it in Bellator at these weight classes. So I don't think stage has anything to do with it. If anything, I think him being lower on the card is kind of a motivating factor for him because he's one of those guys that's still trying to prove, you know, hey, I've done it. I've lost to some really good guys, but I've also beaten some really good guys, and I'd like to extend my career. I'd like to keep fighting in Bellator. You know, I think it's really cool when you see guys like Patricky and Patricio, who are brothers, and they're both, you know, at the top of their game, at the top of their weight classes. So I think the betting, you know, the betting gods, I think Vegas has this one right. I think he's going to win, but I think at minus 305, this is a scary one to put money into. This is a scary one to invest your money on. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, also, another interesting fact is Patricio is the featherweight or not. Fe- well, he is the featherweight and the light he- or lightweight champion in Bellator. And his brother is the third ranked contender at the lightweight division in Bellator. I mean, I'm not saying that they would ever do it, but how cool would that be? Brother Pibble, brother fight for the championship at lightweight. I think that would be pretty sick. I mean, obviously, they're probably not going to do it. They're brothers, but that would be a promotional just like heaven. You know, it's a funny that. thing. It's a funny thing to think about brothers fighting because, you know, the Pitbull brothers probably don't have the same draw like like in the media and socially and just around the world as, you know, maybe a Nick versus Nate Diaz fight in the UFC would pull. But from a technical standpoint and as an MMA fan watching the Pitbull brothers fight would just be one of those fights that's like it, they they would go the whole time and if one of them were to lose it would be on a very very split hair minimal wrong move but you know we're talking about the, the NFL football players say that's a game of inches this one's a game of millimeters you barely move the wrong way you get shut, shut stone cold so yeah absolutely I think that's very interesting, you know, that you bring up this game. It's a deadly game, and it's a game of millimeters, like you say. I mean, you got to move or be hit. And, you know, I, th- I think that's a funny thing to talk about, you know, since we touched on Dom Reyes. He's like, I love this game, but sometimes this game doesn't love me, man. And I think that's a thing that you see a lot of guys go through, but – it's always good to see somebody who's willing to persevere and willing to move through a three three fight slide and 
go back to the drawing board, get back in the training room, and come back and win a fight. Absolutely. All right. Speaking of guys, light heavyweight Grand Prix fight. Speaking of a guy we haven't seen fight mixed martial arts in the octagon in a little while, we have Rumble Johnson versus the late step in for Yoa Romero, Jose Augusto Azevedo. And this guy, he's a younger guy. He's only got about nine, I believe, professional fights. One, only one fight in uh, Bellator. Yeah, and Rumble's opening at minus 450. I think this is as close to a lock as Venom Page, but at minus 450. Where are the odds on the other side? Plus 350. All right, look, I'm going to go on a limb. Rumble Johnson hasn't fought in a while. He has the knockout power, absolutely. But I went back and I watched uh, Augusto's last fight. And, I mean, he looks good on the ground. I mean, he was in a compromised position on the ground in his last fight, and he showed tremendous skill on the ground. And he got the uh, arm triangle for the win. He's also fighting underneath the uh, Pitbull brother gym. So yeah. like we we're just talking about, I mean, these guys from Brazil, all, obviously all they do when they grow up is they love the jujitsu. <clears throat> you know, it's kind of the, I would say, one of their main state sports behind soccer, of course. But th- yeah. I think this is a very underrated fight because you know Yoel stepped out of it um but I would not I would go on a limb this might be a good value pick especially with Rumble being you know minus 450 or whatever he's at I'm, it's close yeah no I uh I, I like what you're saying especially about the ground game because that's never been Rumble's strength but I think in the four-year layoff since the last time we've seen Rumble, you know, we've seen him try to improve. And he's gotten in the submission underground cage twice. You know, he lost to Ryan Bader in submission underground. And Ryan Bader is one of the best wrestlers, you know, that we can, we can talk about. And then he lost to Craig Jones, who Craig Jones versus Brett, Brett Primus or Brent Primus is one of the, you know, one of the best grappling matches that submission underground put on. Craig Jones is awesome on the ground. Craig Jones, I mean, he uh, he's in the same jiu-jitsu gym as Gordon Ryan, probably the best jiu-jitsu player that has ever existed. So, I mean, going toe-to-toe with him every day, Craig Jones is no slouch on the ground. No, so I think – I don't think Rumble is going to go to the ground, but I think if it comes to it, he's going to be able to exhaust, you know, Augusto. I love that. Let's call him that, Augusto. He, we're going to stay away from Azevedo, but uh, I think he's going to be able to tire him out. And then once this fight becomes a, I'm not going to shoot anymore because he's either going to stuff it or we're going to end up in some position where he's just laying this big old body on top of me. So I think this is the one of the night where we see Rumble get the knockout. And, you know, just generally speaking, this light heavyweight Grand Prix really has not yet lived up to what I think we all thought it was going to be. So I think Rumble is going to be the one to set the fireworks off here, get the knockout, and then set up a big matchup with Nemkov that we're really going to have to focus on and think about if Rumble comes out and looks really good. I just Absolutely. think, like, I think like you said, we haven't seen him in a long time, so I don't think we know what to expect. So I think minus 450 is a little high, but given his track record and given the guys he's fought and the, the performances he's had in the past, particularly in the UFC and stuff, you know, I don't see any reason that he does lose this fight to the new kid on the block. Absolutely, and that you do bring up good points. One thing I do want to say about you saying maybe emptying his gas tank, an interesting fact about these two fighters, they both fought at lower weights. Rumble, of course, 170, then 185, now at 205. Uh, Gusto, in his last fight, weighed in under the 205 limit, I think at 203. He came up from 185 in a different promotion. So I don't really see gas tank being an issue because these guys are probably closer to their natural body weight. Well, ironically, I think it's funny that you bring that up because the more you the more I think about it, the more I'm like, you know, historically Rumble has been criticized for his gas tank and for not being able to finish late in fights. So I think he'll get this one done early, but I think him versus Nemkov is gonna be a lot more challenging of a fight. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you on that. All right. 
Main event. To the belt. We have Juan Archuleta for the belt. This is at 135, correct? The bantamweight division. Bantamweight. We have Juan Archuleta as the favorite at minus 159 against the number one contender, Sergio Pettis, who's only plus 125. Yo, I'm saying, bro, that, that's good odds. If you're on a bet on one, I'd take uh, Juan Archuleta the Spaniard on that. That, I mean, especially with the, the, the favorites in the uh, previous fights. I mean, Juan Archuleta is a dog. And he's been training a lot with uh, TJ Delashaw, who was supposed to make his return this weekend, but obviously is not anymore. No, so. that team out. No, he, they're not with Alpha Male anymore. But that gym that Dillashaw's with now, I there those that's some dogs. I can't remember who else is in there with them. Brian Ortega, I think Chael said saw him in their training, but like he said, he goes toe to toe with the best in the world every day. And Archuleta, I mean, he's only lost two times, I believe, and the last time. Like uh, we br- bring up again, I mean, synonymous with the word Bell Tours, Pitbull Brothers. He yeah, lost he lost the featherweight Patricio. Grand Prix to um, Patricio, the, the champion at featherweight. He was obviously going up from 135 to 145, but Juan Archuleta has been dominant. For his, you know, small stature, he has some power. I mean, and he's real technical, and he'll take take you down. I mean, there's very few holes in his game especially when he's fighting at 135. No, I I think this is another one kind of like Michael Venom Page where we're thinking, you know, Juan Archuleta is a very good striker. He's going to come out and his belt's on the line. I think this is personal. But looking at the other side of things, the number one contender, Sergio Pettis, can freaking scrap, dude. He can yeah. He can strike with the best of them. And I think there's a big chip on his shoulder. I think it's – you know, talking about brothers, I think it's tough to be Showtime Pettis' little brother and have to try to do that whole thing. I also think there's an extra factor in there in talking about how Anthony Pettis lost his PFL debut recently. So I think Sergio will go out there and try to avenge his brother. I think this will be a better fight than we give it credit for. I think all of these will end up being better fights than we give them credit for. But like you said at the beginning, I think this is the one you go big money on. I think you take big money on the Spaniard at minus 159 and go collect. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, like you're saying, I was, I was you know, hyping up Archuleta. But I could honestly see this going all five rounds and, you know, Archuleta come out with the decision. In my opinion, probably decisively. No, I think this could definitely – look kind of like a Figueredo Moreno where we see two of the guys at the smaller weight class that want to throw hands and they want to get in the pocket and they're not afraid of each other. You know what I mean? I think this could be one where both guys kind of land shots, trade back and forth. But, you know, I think Archuleta is a guy that's been there, done that. So he rides the roller coaster, takes the emotional highs and the emotional lows of this fight. And, you know, like you said, I think he does kind of get it done in a decision five rounds. Yeah. And just to further my point, I mean, not many people know about Bellator, but I think if you watch his fight on Friday, Archuleta, second best pound for pound fighter in Bellator behind Patricio Pitbull, in my opinion. Yeah, I think you could put I think you could put McKee up there. Mm, uh, yeah. I and like Dave McKee, Lima. but I, not better than Juan Archuleta. Well, not better than Juan Archuleta. No. All right. Yeah, let's switch over. Let's years, talk baby. a little UFC. Let's talk a little UFC where we make make our living. I I make my days go by much quicker by watching all sorts of MMA YouTube and staying connected on Twitter and doing that whole thing. So this one was big because our main event gets pulled. Our main event gets dropped. Like you said, TJ Dillashaw with the cut over his eye, the Sandhagen fight. You know, I'm glad they didn't try to pull – uh, a Montreal screw job and screwed TJ out of this out of this fight and you know replace him with somebody short notice that Corey Sanhagen was probably going to kill anyway. So I think we get a good woman a good women's flyweight fight. And you know really looking at it through and through this is a pretty solid card. I think we got to touch on a couple. I think the one at the bottom makes a lot of sense to talk about at straw weight. You got Amanda Rebus fighting Angela Hill. Angela Hill was the girl that you and I watched together. I don't remember on what fight night, but uh, the announcer said the incredibly racist thing about her hair being spongy 
and that might be a way that being a way for her to absorb punches so yeah as you can see here this is this is michelle watterson the main event but yeah she beat angela hill last time out in september 2020 well angela hill at this point is 36 she fought everybody she you know she lost to rose she lost to nina nunez i believe as well but who did she beat she beat Paige Van Zandt, who's a pretty quality win, bare knuckle FC. I mean, you know? quality if you're looking at her body. <laughs> I don't, I don't think she's bad though. Like, I, I can't shit on Paige Van Zandt as a fighter. She's a, she's a tough girl. She's a bad bitch. But I think this one makes a lot of sense. The odds right now, I have Amanda Rebus at minus one seventy and Angela Hill at plus one forty. So. I think I mean, if this it's, one... it's kind of a toss up in my opinion. I mean, Angela Hills, obviously, like we were just talking about, fought top of the top for years. And, and she's uh, big, really tall. Like yeah. she's really tall, she's really long, and she knows how to use that to her advantage. And she's fighting uh Rebus? Yes. Uh I'm gonna take Rebus on this. I'm you know, kind of homing in on the favorites here, but no, this one I'm definitely thinking is Amanda Rebus by knockout. I think Angela Hill gets through the first round. You know, I think round number two has been the knockout round recently. So, excuse me, I'm going to play, what's the what's the word? Uh, ah, never mind. Anyway, I think, I think Angela Hill is going to get through that second, through the first round. Rebus is going to feel her out. And then I think somewhere in that second round, there's going to be a big punch. And we're going to see one of those TKOs on the ground where we see a couple of big elbows and the referee's got to pull her off. I couldn't agree with you more. I, I think that's the, uh, I think that's Amanda Rebus's game plan. Yeah, man. Uh, as much as we, as much as we usually like to talk about all these fights, we talk, we're talking about two cards this weekend. So we're going to skip the next couple. We have Ben Rothwell fighting Felipe Lenz. In a pick them actually, a toss-up fight at heavyweight. Both of them are minus 110 right now. I don't really know anything about either of those guys, so I'm not going to mislead anybody. Let's talk about Gregor G Gillespie. Yes. I, I want to talk about that one. All right, I'm going to pull up. About Gregor Gillespie. Yeah, let me, let me pull up their, uh, their little recently fights. All right, here we have Gregor Gillespie. Um, last, damn, he, he has only has He only lost to Kevin Lee. Yeah, I mean – other than that, I mean, they're fighting at lightweight, I believe. And Kevin they Lee are. is no slouch. Kevin Lee is a bad man for sure. Well, before that, this guy, before that, Gillespie was on a 12 fight win streak. He's 13 and one. Yeah. Yeah. So, and he had one, two, three, six, six fight win streak in the UFC. I believe he got injured. I'm not really sure what happened, but uh, he took last year off. And uh, from what I know, very good on the ground. Very good. Yes. yes, and I think, you know, like you said, maybe he got injured and we've been talking about rehab, which would definitely be possible. But I think it's always interesting to talk about the psychology behind this if this guy is coming off of his first professional loss. Like you said, Kevin Lee's no slouch. We're not going to, you know, shit on him for losing. But I think it'll be interesting to see how he comes out and what he looks like coming off of that first first professional loss? Did he go back to the training room and improve and get better? And are we going to see him come out and, like you said, get the finish? Or are we going to see him take this thing to a decision and win? Or, or you know, does he have ring him rust? And get, or does he have ring rust? You know, that's always a big factor when a guy has over a year off. Yeah. No, I definitely think slide is the option. But, you know <sighs> – Let's let's go ahead and take a look at his opponent right here, Carlos Diego Ferreira. Yeah, I didn't. He lost to Benio Dairouche. I knew that, but he beat Showtime Pettis by submission. He beat Anthony Pettis. Yeah, he lost. And he lost to Poirier, and he's lost to Ben Up Dariush twice. I mean, he's obviously been he's been in the UFC for what six, almost seven, seven years now. Yeah. Um, he, when I was watching his highlights and going over his tape, he's also a guy that uh, is very good on the ground. So yeah. we might be very well seeing some a lot of ground game in this fight. You know, I wouldn't, that would not surprise me in the bit. You know, interesting. 
because I'm almost willing to take that call and take your advice on that and say, you know, what if we get Gillespie in a third round submission here? I, I think a submission can go either way. Where are the odds on this? Minus 175 for Gillespie and plus 150 for Ferreira. So it's almost even. Yeah, damn near. I mean, I'd be interested. I really want, I'm not going to touch this personally, but I'd be yeah. very interested. I'd be very interested to see how Gillespie comes out. If he, you know, returns to form like he was in 2019, 2018 be very interesting fight you know maybe this cap holds him back to top content not top contender but a contender maybe like top 15 matchup next with somebody yeah. but it'd be very interesting to see how Gregor Gillespie comes back after a long way off no I lied this thing isn't almost even because we almost have Gillespie at two to one odds but unlike you I I don't respect my streak enough to fight off my mental urges so I think I think I'm gonna hammer Gillespie at minus one seventy five, almost two to one odds. Not hammer it as in a shirt pick, but myself, I think I'm gonna go there. I think like I said a second ago, I'm gonna go third round submission on that one. All right. Moving on. What we got next, Zebo? Cowboy with the late uh, with the late step in for Diego Sanchez. Let's just pause for a second and talk about a weird situation. That whole thing was just strange how Diego Sanchez was handled. Uh, Diego Sanchez is an interesting character to put it nicely. Yeah, he mean, was, you can go on YouTube and just search the guy up, and there's a fight with him just doing some weird, weird stuff. Oh man, there's a crazy video of that guy. Uh, I think his name is Joshua Fabian, the corner man that requested all his medical records and started this whole thing. But there's a video of him chasing him around the cage, like with a knife. And having these, like, a real knife and having these dudes run around the cage and do rolls. And, I mean, they, we're talking about some crazy shit here. Yeah, Diego Sanchez might be, hey, where's the CKE? He might have CTE. Yeah, that. You know, being, like, the, the last guy remaining from the first season of The Ultimate Fighter too, like, I don't really care to see him go fight anywhere else. I hope he's done at this point, like. I don't really want to see the Diego Sanchez experiment in Bellator. I think, you know, he was a UFC guy. And he was a UFC fighter. And, you know, maybe he cuts ties with this guy and gets himself straight. And maybe we see him fight again. But I'd prefer to see that. I'd pr prefer to see Diego Sanchez be done. Um, the fight with Cerrone, Cowboy Cerrone and Diego Sanchez, I feel like that fight made a lot more sense for the two of them. No, it I mean, did because it was winner winner moves on and loser retires at that point. One of them was going to be done at the end of this anyway. That's what I'm saying. I mean, if you look at um, Cerrone, he has – let's see. He's on a pretty big losing streak, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah. he's on a he's on a five-fight losing streak minus the no decision. And then he, I believe, grappled. I believe he submission undergrounded and won. Mm -hmm. one time since then but you know I we're talking about Cowboy I think he's one of those guys that at this point like you're like we're looking at right now you're not going to be able to put him in there with Tony Ferguson or Justin Gaethje or Connor we're not putting him in there with a top contender anymore but um, and it brings I, up it brings up an interesting point though he has not fought anything below like the cream of the crop and since Ever. 2018, 2019, that brings yeah, the I mean, question, how good is he actually versus another opponent that's not your Conor McGregor's, your Justin Gaethje's of the world, your Tony Ferguson's of the world? I mean, when you're fighting that high level of competition, it kind of skews people's perspective. Now, no. on the flip side of that, he could totally be done. He, he could just be no gas left and in the tank he could just be completely toast ready to retire and he's just fighting because he has he's fought the most in the UFC ever yeah I mean I think this fight kind of makes sense too because now we're looking at like you said can Cowboy do it against somebody who's not necessarily a top contender or one of the best in the world so we got this guy Alex Morono 
It was actually, we got a shout out, H-Town native. He's a Houston Texan boy, but he's only 30 years old. And they share that common loss to Pettis, like you can see on the screen now. But but that was coming. At, look, if you, if you look, that was December 19, 2020. He was coming off a big win versus Rise McKee just a month earlier. And he has a loss to Chaos Williams, and Chaos Williams has mad power. He also beat huh. Max Gr- Griffin, too. I was so, about to say, Chaos Griffin and Max, Chaos Williams and Max Griffin right there almost like weigh each other out. Like those losses cancel I, each other out. I have to agree. But I mean, if you look back to 2018 when he started the 3 5 win streak, you can, you see he's only had one, uh, one KO. So it was telling me that he doesn't have very much power. And it no, doesn't I, look like, good. In his entire career, I'm only seeing five five knockouts, but he's got six submissions and six decisions as well. So, I mean, we'll see. I mean, this is going to be pretty much a determinant for where Cowboy Cerrone goes for the rest of his career, if he retires, if he stays as – I say this every fucking week, but there's always a gatekeeper for, the top, for, for you to get from top 15 to top 10, you know? But we'll see. I think Cowboys done. Where are the odds? That they don't have the site I'm on right now doesn't have them. Doesn't have anything up because it was such a late replacement. I think he didn't he didn't step in until either today or yesterday. They didn't they just figured that one out. But uh you know, I think I think I disagree with you. I think we see I think we see a classic cowboy here. I don't think we see him put him out by any means, but I think Cowboy will get a win. And I don't think that necessarily extends his UFC career. I don't think that necessarily gets him higher up in the rankings. I, I think we see him fighting guys like this for the remainder of his career. Or on the flip side, we see him fighting guys his own age. You know, maybe we see another Cowboy main card, but it's against somebody else who's also pretty close to 40. Well, I don't know. There's something about this one that just like you said, I don't see the power from Morono. So I think, I think Cowboy is going to find a way to get it done. All right, well, I'll take Morono on this on a limb. I think Cowboy is out. out. Doesn't have any tank. He doesn't have any left in the tank. Yeah, I I think it was interesting though that that this fight's at welterweight. That Cowboy's back at 170 because he made a comment, however long ago, about saying he was going to commit to moving down to 155 and trying to run through that gauntlet to get one shot at the belt. And you know, I think he was barring for his Connor rematch, but. Yeah. I don't think anybody wants to see that. And I think at the end of the day, the reason that we see Cowboy at 170 is because it doesn't make any sense for him to go make a run at 155 because I don't think he can go make a run at 155. Well, not only or that, he's, 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 he's been beat by, like, all the top contenders. I mean, you tell me he'd have to get a rematch versus Tony Ferg versus Justin Gaethje versus Connor. And I, I don't see that happening. I think 170 makes more sense for him. Was the Nico Price fight at 170 or 155? I'm not completely sure, actually. I don't it's, know. Yeah. Anywho, I mean, we'll see. He fought Connor at 170, got destroyed. So I don't really see this making much of a difference, in my opinion. Yeah, agreed. But let's move on to co-main. This was kind of the the interesting one, the one I kind of wanted to get pick your brain about. We got Jeff Neal versus Neil Magny. Jeff Neal's currently the favorite at minus 188, again, close to two to one. And then Neil Magny is plus 162. All right. So, my opinion, I've seen both these guys fight a lot. And I'm yeah, completely honest too. with you, until I saw this fight, I was like, I really thought these guys were the same people. They have similar names. They look <laughs> similar. And, like, every time I, I was like, I'd see one fight, I was like, Wait, I thought his name was uh, Jeff Neal. Oh, wait, I thought his name was Neil Magny. I was like, well, wouldn't that be cool if they fought? And sure enough, here we go. UFC grand my wishes, I guess. But um, I'm going to have to go with Jeff Neal right here. Uh, hands of steel. He, yeah. he's, uh, he's a little bit younger. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at their recent fights. All right. Oh. You know, this fight was actually supposed to happen. I believe in August of 2020. So working on almost a year ago coming up, but uh, 
you know, like you said, pretty similar fighters, both really tough guys, both guys that can throw hands. So definitely a fight I'm interested in seeing. Definitely a matchup that I think makes a lot of sense, especially because like you see, last time we saw Jeff Neal was against Wonder Boy and he, he took he didn't look good. to a five round decision. That's what I mean. He didn't look great against Wonder Boy. He didn't look fantastic, but he got his licks in and he could have I mean, looked a lot look, worse. He took him to a decision. His record, no slouches. I mean, you got Bilal Muhammad. He's yeah. a beast. You got Nico Price. He's a beast. Mike Perry. As much used to be a beast. Want to talk about him. He's a brawler. Interesting. But to look, see you even here. got Kevin Holland down there. That's interesting. And what is that? Extreme knockout? Yeah. Hey. I mean, if you can go toe-to-toe with Kevin Holland, more power to you. Right. So, I mean, I like Jeff Neal. He definitely has – he has the power to put you out. And I I like watching him a lot. All right. We're going to Neil Magny. Yeah, Neil Magny's coming off that loss to Michael Chiesa was his last fight. Tough, tough fight. Very tough fight. I watched that. I mean, he didn't look bad. He just looked out class, in my opinion. Well, my thing is, Neil Magny is a very tough guy. You know, he was the one and only guy that came after Hamza. He came after Chamaya back when nobody wanted to fight him. He was the only guy that stepped up to that challenge. And he's a guy that, you know, he's got a chin. He, he's not afraid to get in the pocket and trade with guys. And, you know, Neil Magny's not going to back down from Jeff Neal, even if he does have hands of steel. <laughs> I mean, he got a win over Carlos Conduit, Big Rig Hendricks. Um, and Robbie Lawler, I mean, he has some quality names, although in between those, he doesn't have anybody really necessarily interesting. I mean, like I, think, I said, you, as you can see, a lot of this decision wins. Um, I mean, he has one submission and one KO, but uh, just pretty interesting in my opinion because it's very hard to distinct. They don't have brands. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Can't really distinguish them too well. But I do like uh, Jeff Neal at minus, minus 188. Minus 188. I'll take Jeff Neal on that. I think, like, uh, I feel like I talk about him every show because I'm just so infatuated with the Chemayev experience, like with the experiment and the potential for how good he can be. We and might have. Pause. We might have to just sit here and do a live stream next fight for whenever he decides to come back. Oh, that'd be awesome. I, I've all I've really always thought about doing some commentary, and if we could get some dedicated CKE fans to tune in and mute their TVs, I think you and I could do a dope little live stream for the Chimaev comeback fight. Yeah, I mean, comment below, I guess, if uh, y'all want to see a live stream for the Kamaya fight whenever that ends up happening. No, but I think, you know, just tying it back, I think if Neil Magny can get a win here, I think that's what you got to do with Chimaev at that point because Nick Diaz turned him down. And I don't think Dana has any leverage on Nick Diaz to force that fight kind of like he did on Leon. And I think if Leon wins, he goes to the title fight. So I think... Even if Leon loses, Leon maybe fights Masvidal or something like that. You know, maybe we get the three-piece in a soda fight, or maybe they try to make remake Chamaya versus Edwards. But more than likely, I think Chamaya versus Magny is what coming up is what is coming up because I think Magny is going to win in a decision in this fight at plus one sixty-two. Because, like you said, I think I think I was rolling heavy with the favorites like you were, and I think if there's an underdog for me to sneak in here, I think I'm going to sneak Neil Magny in at plus 162. All right, all right, I like that. And then the main event of the evening, Marina Rodriguez, minus 200 against the underdog, Michelle Waterson, at plus 170 in the women's flyweight division. All right, let's take a look at what they've been up to recently. Take a look at the underdog. Uh, she oh. recently beat Angela Hill, which we just talked about earlier. Also, you can see her competition. Competition. I mean, yeah, she's I mean, been Carlos fighting the top of the top for the past four years. Went over PVZ, Paige Van Zant right here. A little I mama. Think, 
don't quote me on this until we see it, but I believe they both have wins over Paige Van Zant. I know they and I know they both have fought Carla Esparza, but I think Marina Rock lost to her her. too. Oh, they both lost to Carla Esparza. I mean, she has lost to Joanna. She went the distance with Joanna, which not very very many women can do. Yeah. Lost to Tisha Torres. She's very solid. Obviously, the champion, the thug. Man, that's so awesome. Dude, I know that was that was great last or last week, two weekends ago. Two weekends ago. Yeah, that was awesome. All right, so she's coming in at eight and eight, or eighteen and eight. Yeah. Um, now let's take a look at the uh, her opponent, the favorite, Amanda Rebus, who is also on this card. Yeah. She beat her via TKO. Yeah. To Carla Esparza, she beat Tisha Torres. I mean, also had a draw with Miranda Marcos, Marcos, who we saw last week. Um, that's unfortunate that she had that no contest or DQ, whatever they decide to call that. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, she's coming in at 13 and one, obviously coming on record 13 and one, you're going to be the favorite. Well, she just, I believe that that went over, uh, Amanda Rebus. I don't believe I can see it now. TKO by elbows. So I think that's everything that I've heard going into this fight because, it's been rumored since since PJ Dillashaw pulled out last week that they were going to make this fight, but there was something about it, one of their physicals. Like both is this of them on short term? Is this on short notice? No, I believe this fight was already on the card. I, I okay. think it got bumped to main event. Okay. But there was there was about this one was about to get pulled too because there was something wrong with one of their physicals. They both signed contracts and were ready to do it. But the UFC didn't announce it officially until today, I believe, for some reason. So, you know, in the short term and the the opening, everything that I've heard is that Marina Rodriguez and her 13 and one record come with power for women's flyweight. So I think we see the karate hottie get cooled down here. I think we see Marina Rodriguez with another TKO win. Well, I mean, I've only picked favorites, so I mean, might as well take the underdog on the main event of this weekend's fight. I'll take Michelle Watterson with her wealth of experience. All right. All right. I mean. So we got picks. It, we got picks brought to you by Shithead and Shithead Sportsbook. Um, um, let me pick your brain about a couple of other things before we get out of here, just real quick. I don't know if we're running long or anything yet, but. Nick Nick Diaz, not Nick Diaz, Nate Diaz, excuse me, pulls out of his fight on May 15th with Leon Edwards. Thankfully, it seems that Nate's committed to that fight because they've already pushed it to the June 12th card that also has the Izzy Vittori and the Figueredo Moreno 2 on it in Phoenix. So that's going to be awesome. But the first time since 2004 in his entire career that we've seen Nate Diaz not fight in a scheduled fight. So I think it's interesting. To what do you look mean by scheduled fight? Like the first time he's ever had to delay or pull out or do anything like that. Like usually he signs the line, shows up on the date and fights. Dude, but I think the, I'm, te- I think- I'm telling you, there's, there's some kind of bad juju on Leon that where this guy can never set a date and fight his entire fight. I mean, we had that whole debacle with Kamaya last year. And even this year, three or four times it was delayed and then canceled. And then he finally got a fight on short-term nose versus uh, Benel Dariush. Or no, no, uh, Bilal Muhammad. Bilal Muhammad. Yeah. And then, of course, that was unfortunate. I mean, he was looking good. Then eye pokes and, and no contest in, ensued. So that was very unfortunate. And then now, you know, can't. Has a date set against uh, Diaz. Can't even get that going. I think there's just bad juju surrounding that guy for whatever reason. It just, it just, the, the, the real thing that sucks for him is that he now goes from his co main five round fight on one of the bigger cards of the year and he stays on one of the biggest cards of the year. Not to like disrespect the card, but he, he moves down. 
there's no way he's going to be co-main or main event if there's two belt fights on the line. He's got to be at least a third fight down on that card. So I, mean, I wonder. I, I'm interested to see if they make it a five round fight still. Because I mean, like a couple weeks ago with the uh, past pay per view, they had three uh, five round fights. So it's not yeah. out of the question. No, it definitely makes sense, and I definitely you know, would like to see it because I think we've talked about the matchup enough without actually talking about the matchup to say that it makes sense. But more than anything, I and seeing Nate Diaz have to pull out with an injury, I think it just shows that, you know, he's taking a comeback seriously. Like, he, he really wants to get back and do this thing. And he, for whatever reason, he really wants to beat Leon Edwards' ass. So, you know, I think maybe he wants that title fight, but I've said it a hundred times and I'll say it a hundred more. I don't really want to see Nate Diaz versus Usman. So, absolutely not. Absolutely. All well, right, let me hit, let me hit you with one more thing, and then we'll 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 get out of here. What do you think is what do you think is going on at heavyweight? Because I have a theory now. What do you think the whole debacle is with the heavyweight belt in Francis? Um, I have a hard time believing it's due to money, like John Jones wants to say, and he's coming with a lot of heat on social media to Francis. I mean, maybe this is all some kind of, you know, scheme to, like, hype it up, which probably it is. You know, John Jones, probably, I'd say, top two, three biggest pay-per-view pull-ins behind McGregor, of course. And Francis, you know, he's the new PPV star. So, I mean, it's interesting to see what they're going to do, but I don't think John Jones has a lot of leverage and the fact that Francis has an opponent that's ranked and deserves a title fight in Derek Lewis, but the, they've already fought, and that was – they were both scared of getting knocked out by each other. So it's interesting yeah, it's to horribly see. Boring. Yeah, so, I mean, does Dana want to, you know, run that back? I don't think he necessarily does, especially with – how timid they both were the first time they fought. No, I, I can agree with that, but I have, I bring to the viewers and to my friend two pieces, largely that are considered speculation and largely that might just be coming out of left field. Allegedly? Not allegedly, but, you know, I might be drawing conclusions based off of things that might not necessarily need conclusions to be drawn off of them especially in terms of, one, we've seen Francis and Ganu go back and forth on social media with Tyson Fury. I, I personally think that, you know, you give Francis the same amount of time you gave John Jones to move to heavyweight, you give him like nine months to just solely train boxing. I think, we might, I think that might be huge. I think that would be an awesome fight. I don't, I don't know if he beats the Gypsy King necessarily, but I definitely think Francis has that body type and just that natural athletic ability that if, especially if you take away the kicking and the wrestling game and you let him focus solely on what he does the best, which is hitting people as hard as he can, like, I think it's possible. I think you bring up a good point, but on the boxing side, you see the Gypsy King recently, not recently, but last year dismantled the last knockout artist, the Bronze Bomber. Uh, what's his name? Deontay Wilder. Deontay Wilder, yeah. And he knocked him out. And he was pal He was billed as like he had what almost all his fights into knockout. You know, so yeah. I don't know if Francis wants to do that. That guy's the Gypsy King's insane. I mean, it'd be a money grab for him for sure, and he would never have to worry about it. But. I mean, are we just not running back McGregor versus Mayweather? Is that what we're looking at? A box boxer fighting an MMA fighter in a boxing ring? I'm not very interested in it. I I don't mind the idea of it. And like I said, you know, I I think if you give it the right amount of time, maybe. Like I said, like I think if you rush Francis in there, he went he defends his belt and then he fights Tyson Fury six months later. I don't even think that's going to be fun to watch, like you said. But I think if you really, you know, give him a year to devote solely to boxing, I think he'll get with some of the best guys in the country, and I think he'll find a way to figure it out. But 
the only reason I bring Tyson Fury and the only reason I even introduced that argument is because there was a tweet where Ngannou said, I'm going to deal with Jones first and then I'll come wipe the floor with your ass, basically. So I was intrigued because right now the media is leading us to believe that Derek Jones has that fight. Derek, or not Derek Jones, Derek Lewis. Derek Lewis is leading us to believe that he has that fight. So I feel like there's something fishy going on because I don't think that even though English isn't his first language, I don't think Francis just accidentally, like I did, you know, English is my first language, so maybe he did, but I don't think he accidentally switched Jones and Lewis. I think he intentionally said that. And then the second point I bring you that comes solely out of speculation, maybe it's because he's trying to move up to heavyweight, maybe it's because he's trying to do it at another division, but... John Jones is not a guy that's known for being in the gym. He's not a guy that's known for being in there year round and doing all of this work. He's a guy that he's a training camp guy. He gets a fight. He trains for six weeks at whatever level of training he does. And then just because he's such a naturally skilled athlete, he goes in and gets it, gets it done. But I, the I, past beg, couple I beg to differ on that point. I mean, you can see John Jones has been packing on the muscle and packing on the weight. Been looking that's good. That's my point. That's my I mean, point. He, I think, I think his reputation obviously has been char- uh, tarnished with all his incidents with the law and he failed drug tests. But I think what hurt his ego was not being the pound for pound champ. And when Khabib took the goat status, I think that really hurt John Jones's ego. He is well. I've cleaned the floor with the light heavyweights for years. People have been wanting me to go up to heavyweight for a long time, and he never did it. And of course, now he's doing it. You know, this is to cement his legacy as the greatest mixed martial artist of all time. No, I definitely agree, because like you said, if he gets the heavyweight belt, there's not really even a discussion about it I think we have to have. I'm typically a guy that's pretty, you know, anti-steroids, and like Cormier said, you know, maybe we can't even consider Jones in the GOAT conversation because of that. But I'm also a guy that believes in forgiveness and that as much as we want to put these athletes on a pedestal, they're human as we are. So they make mistakes. And, you know, I'm willing to forgive John Jones. I'm willing to forgive TJ Dillashaw and all these guys as long as they, you know, come back, clean up their act and maintain the same level of performance that they did when they were on steroids. But like you were saying, John Jones is in the gym and he's in the gym a lot. It's all over his social media. And like you said, some of these workouts he's doing, you can't just go in the gym and do. Like, there is no way in hell that my fat ass is walking into a gym and jumping on a treadmill and saying, hmm, let me run 22 miles an hour just for fun. So John Jones has definitely been working. But like like you said, I don't, or I guess like I was leading into, I don't think John Jones is a guy that just works for no reason. I think John Jones has something planned. I think John Jones is working for something And like you had kind of alluded to, I think Francis and Jones and Dana and Derek Lewis and everybody in the UFC knows something that we don't, and they're waiting for the right time to announce it. So I'm thinking maybe we see Jones v. Ngannou get announced for early September, late August on the June 12th card. Or what if we see it get announced on the July 10th card? Like something where a bunch of people are just watching. Yeah, I could see that on the McGregor card. Yeah. All right, I'm running this last thing by you. Do you think this is all just Jones buying time to get bigger, to get stronger, to perfect his clock craft? Because he hasn't been in the octagon in like a year. You no, know? I I definitely buy that. I absolutely do. You know, not to allude to Joe Rogan again to talk about Joe Rogan, but he said, you know, John Jones's calves look like the size of his forearm which is not true. I, you know, John Jones is not a small man by any means, but compared to Francis, like you saw what Francis did to Stipe, even though we made the speculation about whether Stipe being smaller and quicker and more fluid in terms of movement would make a difference. And it really didn't. So I think like you're saying, maybe John Jones is buying more time to put on that weight and get in the best physical shape to go into this fight. So he doesn't just get touched once and go down. So we can see a five round John Jones masterpiece of MMA where he goes in there and breaks him. 
yeah. Also, just putting this out there, Fran or Stipe does not even come close to moving like John Jones does at that size. Nobody moves like John Jones. I'll give you that. No, I'll give you that. But I would prefer to see John Jones come in at closer to 240, maybe hopefully above 240, 245 range, rather than closer to 230, like Stipe did. Yeah, I agree. All right. Thank you for watching the Calf Kick Experience, my friends. Your boys at Shithead Sportsbook Incorporated. From everybody at Calf Kick Experience, signing out.